participating in research. So uh, he still apparently finds time to travel because I know I have uh, called him in Germany to ask him a random question about a patient and he answers quite lovely um, and to do some volunteer work. So Dr. Pandy, thank you for squeezing us into your schedule. Um, and I'm quite excited to hear about the uh, new updates for AFib. So thank you. Thanks so much, Jenny, for uh, that kind introduction. Um, I'm just going to see if I can launch the uh, slides again. And are you able to see my slides now? Yep. OK, perfect. So thanks so much for that kind introduction. Um, these are my disclosures. Um, I think the most relevant disclosure is uh, that I've been fortunate to be a principal investigator on many of the trials that we'll be referencing today, which I think does bring bias because I take ownership over uh, some of the work that we'll be presenting, but hopefully it also provides a little bit of insight to how relevant those trials could be. So the agenda uh, for today is to really talk about the burden of AFib and how it's increasing and becoming a much more prevalent cardiovascular condition. Obviously, the role of stroke reduction and strategies to minimize embolic events, the controversy between rate versus rhythm control, and um, the role of lifestyle rehab. As uh, Jen, Jenny uh, mentioned, uh, I'm a firm believer in cardiac rehabilitation and the role of lifestyle in cardiovascular disease control and prevention, and, and certainly in AFib alone. Uh, as well, there is now a burgeoning data set as to the importance of lifestyle. So um, atrial fibrillation, we all know, is a very common disorder. Uh, the lifetime risk of those of us above the age of 40 um, is about one in one in four of us will develop atrial fibrillation during the remainder of our lifetime once we're 40. Uh, it's the most common sustained arrhythmia in the population with as much as 2% of the general population being affected by AFib. And it's estimated that about 350,000 Canadians uh, have atrial fibrillation at any given time. Um, and certainly as we age, we know the incidence of AFib goes up. Above the age of 45, 3% of Canadians have AFib and above the age of 65, um, as much as 6% have it. Men are slightly more affected by atrial fibrillation than women. There's a 1.4 fold greater risk of developing atrial fibrillation adjusted for age and risk factors. Having said that, women have a greater implication from atrial fib. There's a slightly higher embolic rate and stroke race rate in women who develop atrial fibrillation. So certainly uh, this uh, disease affects both genders with veracity. We also know that atrial fibrillation is a disease of aging. And as uh, those of us who are boomers or close to being boomers, uh, the epidemic of atrial fibrillation will only continue to increase as our population continues to age. And uh, so certainly it will continue to be a burgeoning disease state. Um, certainly when, you know, there are routine investigations that we all initiate when someone presents with atrial fibrillation, really looking at history and physical as well as labs to determine is there underlying structural heart disease or uh, cardiovascular conditions that could be triggering atrial fibrillation. Thyroid disorders, both hypo and particularly hyperthyroid, particularly in the elderly population, uh, often presents as atrial fibrillation. Um, you know, uh, very famously, George H. Bush, his first presentation of hyperthyroidism was rapid atrial fibrillation when he was visiting Japan and and uh, became very ill uh, while meeting the, uh, the king of Japan, apparently. Anemia, uh, particularly severe anemia, can be a trigger of atrial fibrillation. And certainly alcohol, both excess alcohol and excess and withdrawal from alcohol, the holiday heart syndrome, is certainly a trigger to atrial fibrillation. Routine ECG investigations really are triggered around one confirming atrial fibrillation as the rhythm, seeing if there's any evidence for underlying uh, structural or ischemic heart disease, uh, and seeing if there's any accessory pathways like WPW that can have a greater impact in atrial fibrillation and accelerate the rate response to atrial fibrillation. You know, pulmonary conditions like pneumonia can be a trigger to atrial fibrillation. Again, in an elderly population in particular, uh, pneumonia can sometimes present as arrhythmias and atrial fib due to the increased right heart strain and right atrial stretch that pulmonary conditions can trigger, uh, triggering atrial fib. But not just me, Sleep apnea that we'll talk about a little bit later is a significant trigger to atrial fibrillation. 
Certainly echocardiography is commonly deployed to see is there underlying structural heart disease, valvular heart disease, and we'll talk about the implication of valvular heart disease in AFib in a few minutes, but also could there be a cardiomyopathy? We know that atrial fibrillation can be triggered by heart failure and cardiomyopathy, but in reverse, atrial fibrillation can be a cause of cardiomyopathy. Uh, the concept of arrhythmia-induced uh, cardiomyopathy is becoming much more uh, understood and just the irregularity of the pulse, as well as the tachycardia that atrial fibrillation and triggers can cause LV impairment. Certainly ischemia can be a trigger to atrial fibrillation and stress testing and whole term monitoring is used both to assess for ischemia, but also to assess the adequacy of rate control in atrial fibrillation. So certainly routine investigations um, are important when they first present with atrial fib. But the immediacy of when someone presents with atrial fib, particularly in eMERGE, is often to determine is there a need to cardiovert somebody or should we control the rate and see how they make out subsequently. And historically, we used to cardiovert a much larger number of patients when they presented to eMERGE. Now, essentially, we reserve that for those that either have very nuanced atrial fibrillation within a few hours and are eager to try to restore sinus rhythm or primarily in those that develop some form of hemodynamic distress. Either they're having ongoing chest pains due to the rapid or irregular pulse, they're starting to develop atrial fibrillation induced heart failure, or they're hemodynamically compromised with hypotension. In those circumstances, regardless of the duration of atrial fibrillation, if there is evidence for hemodynamic distress, patients should be either chemically or primarily electrically cardioverted out of atrial fib, even if the atrial fib has been of long duration and has not been anticoagulated. But in the vast majority of individuals that are not in distress, our goal is initially in terms of rhythm management to control the rate and then focus on uh, stroke prevention and subsequently decide about the need for uh, restoring sinus rhythm. We certainly know that stroke prevention is a key goal for atrial fibrillation management. AFib increases the risk of stroke fivefold, and as much as 20% of strokes in the U.S. are attributed to atrial fibrillation. Wow, where's yeah. Above the age of 80, atrial fibrillation is linked to one in three Lay strokes. Where's the great belt with very time common the uh, facing you. Hope the pipe cleaner ends through. And we've had very effective strategies for prevention atrial fib for many decades. The trials with warfarin dating back to the, the late 80s and 90s, if you know, categorically showed that warfarin compared to placebo reduced the risk for stroke and embolic events by over 60%. And compared to antiplatelet therapy, either single antiplatelet therapy of aspirin or even dual antiplatelet therapy with aspirin and clopidogrel, warfarin was far superior at preventing stroke. So we've had effective stroke prevention strategies for many decades now in atrial fib. The issue that we all know is that warfarin has a very therape a narrow therapeutic window. If the INR in, uh, on patients on warfarin drops much below 1.9, 1.8, the risk of ischemic stroke goes up significantly and rapidly. And if the INR falls much higher than particularly four, um, then the, the risk of intracranial hemorrhaging and systemic uh, bleeding complications can go up significantly. Although the risk is actually much greater with lower INRs than with slightly higher INRs. So, you know, we've struggled sometimes with warfarin management because it interacts with so many things, including dietary changes and various uh, medications that can impact um, the uh, the INR and warfarin use. So as a result, obviously a lot of focus was done now over a decade ago on finding alternatives to warfarin. And we've been very fortunate. We actually have a, a, a good smattering of options that, that uh, NOACs or non-vitamin uh, you know, K dependent uh, anticoagulants um, have been effectively shown. Dibigatrin, rivaroxaban, and didoxaban are the four uh, that uh, are available in Canada and all four are very effective at uh, reducing stroke and systemic embolism, at least as good as warfarin and in the case of uh, a couple of them perhaps better uh, than warfarin at stroke and systemic embolism reduction. Similarly, their bleeding complication rates are at least as good as warfarin and in the case of apixaban and doxaban, 
better and lower bleeding rates uh, than uh, um, than warfarin. But the big reason that we turn to the use of uh, non-vitamin K dependent anticoagulants is really their ease of use. They don't interact with foods. They don't interact with many uh, other medications that warfarin interacts with, and they're just much simpler to use. They don't require constant adjustments of dosing. And so because of the both efficacy and their ease of use, now over uh, almost a, a year, uh, 10 years ago, the Canadian Cardiovascular Society really simplified the anti-thrombotic uh, th anticoagulant use strategies in patients with atrial fib and suggested that all patients above the age of 65 should automatically be considered for oral anticoagulants, primarily with a NOAC. If they're younger than 65, then we use the CHADS scoring system that you're all well aware of, stroke, hypertension, heart failure, or diabetes. If they have any of those uh, risk factors, they should be on oral anticoagulation. If they don't have that, they're younger than 65 and have no CHADS risk factors, then we go on to see, do they have any evidence for atherosclerotic disease, either coronary disease, aortic atherosclerosis, peripheral atherosclerosis. If they do, then they should be on aspirin, not for the atrial fibrillation, but because they have atherosclerotic disease that warrants antiplatelet therapy. Antiplatelet therapy by itself really has little or no role in atrial fibrillation management. So we would deploy that primarily for those that require that for that atherosclerotic disease. If they have none of those features and don't have any atherosclerotic disease, then they should be on no antithrombotics. Uh, a number of patients that do not require anticoagulation are still receiving anticoagulation. So it is about getting appropriate patients appropriately anticoagulated and avoiding the risk of bleeding in those that do not warrant it because their risk of stroke and systemic embolism is low. So that does really simplify our decision making. And since 2012, the Canadian Cardiovascular Society has recommended that oral anticoagulation with AFib should be considered in all those with a CHAD score above zero. And most patients should re receive a non-vitamin K uh, NOAC in preference to warfarin. Um, and that should be the first choice in patients who develop new onset atrial fibrillation that warrant anticoagulation. But does warfarin still have a role in any patients with atrial fibrillation? And yeah, it does. Certainly there are two groups of patients that still require warfarin therapy. Those with mechanical heart valves, there was a trial now about 10 years ago called Realign that randomized patients to dibigatran versus warfarin and patients with mechanical heart valves and showed higher thrombotic events, both valve thrombosis and systemic embolism in those that were on dibigatran, the NOAC, versus those that were on warfarin. And there was also uh, greater bleeding complications with uh, dibigatran in that setting. There have been no other large trials looking at the other NOACs, and I don't think there ever will be. You know, warfarin is the preferred drug of choice in patients with mechanical heart valves, both in sinus rhythm as well as in mechanical heart valve patients that develop atrial fibrillation. The other group of patients that still require warfarin are those with rheumatic heart disease, specifically rheumatic mitral stenosis. And this trial called Invictus, led by Stuart Conley from, uh, from uh, Hamilton, just came out last year, late last year, showing that the patients that were randomized to rivaroxaban versus those that were on warfarin, those on warfarin had much lower uh, systemic embolism, strokes, and even bleeding complications when they were on uh, warfarin versus those that were on rivaroxaban with rheumatic mitral stenosis. So the two group of patients where warfarin is still preferred in atrial fibrillation are those that develop atrial fib in the setting of rheumatic mitral stenosis or those that have atrial fibrillation and mechanical heart valves. In all other patients, NOACs are preferred drugs of choice both because of their efficacy at stroke prevention, as well as its lower bleeding rates and the simplicity of use with less interactions. One of the questions that often comes up is what to do with those that start developing renal impairment? How should we be treating patients with atrial fib that have CKD? We know CKD both increases the incidence of atrial fibrillation, but also increases the systemic embolism and stroke risk and mortality risk associated with atrial fibrillation. So we certainly need to be thinking about stroke prevention and anticoagulation in that patient population. The question really comes down to how should we do that? 
We know that in those with moderate degrees of renal impairment with creatinine clearance down to 30, the NOACs can be safely deployed in that population in the vast majority of patients with low bleeding complications and low uh, you know, uh, bleeding related mortalities. This was a, a safety trial. The Engage AF looking at adoxaban, one of the NOACs showing that it had a better safety profile even with uh, moderate renal impairment down to a creatinine clearance of 30. And the meta-analysis of all of the NOAC trials has shown consistently that NOACs are preferred drugs in moderate degrees of renal impairment down to an EGFR of 30, both in terms of better stroke prevention as well as lower bleeding complications. And so certainly in the moderately renal impaired patient, they are very effective choices. And the Canadian Cardiovascular Society guidelines suggest that those that have an EGFR above 30 should be on a NOAC, and the three preferred NOACs in that setting are apixaban, rivaroxaban, and adoxaban. Dabigatran is more renally cleared than the other NOACs, and thus is, is generally avoided once renal status starts to deteriorate. But apixaban, rivaroxaban, and, and adoxaban, the factor 10A inhibitors, are you know, very easily used in that population, down to an EGFR of 30. Um, those that have further renal impairment warfarin may still be uh, preferred in that setting. So certainly one of the, the questions that comes up is how often should we be measuring war, uh, renal status in patients on NOAC therapy? If their renal function is preserved, it is recommended that they have renal function assessment on an annual basis to ensure that renal function doesn't decline and that the dose of the NOAC doesn't need to be reduced. So if their renal function preserved once a year, if they have moderate degrees of renal impairment down to a creatinine clearance of 30, it should be measured every six months. And those with more advanced renal impairment with EGFRs between 30 to, to 15, it should be measured every three months. Um, traditionally, the drug of choice in patients with CKD and end-stage renal disease and dialysis patients has been warfarin when they develop atrial fibrillation. The reasoning is that warfarin undergoes extensive hepatic metabolism into inactive compounds and at least theoretically poses less risk to the renally impaired patient. But it's even more challenging to use in renally impaired patients than in renally intact patients with much more fluctuations of INR. So it's definitely a challenging drug to use. Um, there have been two small trials trying to look at you know, the use of NOACs in patients with renally impaired, severe renal impairment and dialysis patients. This was called the renal AF trial presented in 2019. And it randomized a very small number of patients uh, to either Pixaban or Warfarin. And in this small trial, there was similar, or in fact, slightly slower, uh, slightly lower stroke rates in those that were on Apixaban versus Warfarin. Bleeding rates were similar. There was a slightly higher hemodialysis access site bleeding complication in those that were on Apixaban, but systemic bleeds like GI bleeds were actually uh, numerically lower uh, than uh, with apixaban than warfarin. It was really not powered enough to really look at those individual say, points and it was a very small trial. There is no large trial yet available that guides us. Another small trial of just under 100 patients showed similar results again between apixaban and warfarin showing similar stroke and systemic embolism reduction and similar bleeding complication rates. And you know the largest uh, data set that has come out recently was a retrospective cohort study of just over 17,000 U.S. Medicare beneficiaries that had uh, renal impairment were receiving dialysis and uh, they compared those that were on warfarin versus those that were on apixaban for atrial fibrillation showing similar stroke risk reduction but slightly lower bleeding complications than those that were on apixaban versus warfarin. This is obviously not a randomized trial. This is a cohort study and we always have to take those results with a grain of salt. Why were those patients chosen for one or the other? You really can't adequately match for them. But it does perhaps tell us that maybe apixaban may be an option in some of those patients, but we're really at a point of clinical equipoise. Apixaban has received cautious approval by the US FDA in those that have severe renal impairment or those undergoing dialysis requiring atrial fibrillation. But in Canada, apixaban is still not recommended 
in those with creatinine clearance less than 15 or those undergoing dialysis by Thrombosis Canada. So it is an equipoise uh, between some guideline committees suggesting it may be an option, others not recommending it yet. Likely in Canada, the, the majority of clinicians still use warfarin in that setting, although because of its difficulty of use, there may be an option to think about apixaban as a potential op uh, option. Another question that often comes up is, what do you do about the patient that falls? As I said, you know, atrial fibrillation is a disease of the elderly, and as they age and frailty develops, obviously these individuals are at risk for falls. And that's always a question is, is it safe to anticoagulate these individuals? There has been you know, good uh, analysis put into trying to determine, is it safe to anticoagulate the fallers? And so this was a very interesting uh, data analysis uh, that looked at what is the risk of for example, subdural hematoma. Well, just being on warfarin, the risk for subdural hematoma is felt to be about 0.04% per year. Uh, in someone who falls versus doesn't, the risk, relative risk is 1.4. And if they're on warfarin versus not on warfarin, the relative risk is 3.3. So what does all those numbers mean? It means that someone would have to fall about 295 times a year to outweigh the benefits of warfarin. Uh, if they have atrial fibrillation, regardless of age or baseline stroke risk. So the average person who's at a fall risk falls just about twice a year. And certainly in that setting, they may still benefit from anticoagulation. This was trial data with or analysis data of warfarin. But when you look at the, the NOAX, their complication rates are even lower. So this was a trial with adoxaban, um, the etna af trial looking at patients who are at an increased fall risk versus those not at an increased fall risk. And what they showed is that those that are at a greater fall risk, uh, edoxaban had lower hemorrhagic stroke rates, lower intracranial hemorrhage, lower life-threatening bleeding, and all-cause mortality was lower. Um, so certainly with the NOACs available to us, like edoxaban, uh, you know, even those that have some degree of risk for fall may still benefit from the stroke risk reduction because often they will have very high CHAD score and that's part of the determinant of their frailty as well. Um, there's been a, another trial that just came out called Elder Care AF that looked at very low dose edoxaban in the very elderly population with AF those above the age of 80, and they were put on uh, really a baby dose of edoxaban, 15 milligrams versus placebo, and showed that, again, embolic events and strokes were significantly lower in those that were on the very low dose of edoxaban. And bleeding rates, while slightly higher, were minor bleeding. Major bleeding was not significantly different in those with edoxaban. There was no increase in intracranial hemorrhage and no fetal fatal bleeding observed. So, you know, if there is concerns about the extreme elderly and the risk for, for uh, anticoagulation, then perhaps lower reduced doses of NOAX may be an option in that setting. Um, are there individuals where anticoagulation is truly contraindicated? Well, clearly there is. If they've had intracranial hemorrhage or risk for active ongoing bleeding, we would not anticoagulate them. How do we reduce their stroke risk? Well, fortunately, 90% of all thrombi in non-rheumatic atrial fibrillation originates from the left atrial appendage. And that has allowed for the development of devices, left atrial appendage closure devices, which are essentially umbrellas that we put in to the mouth of the left atrial appendage where that thrombus uh, that you can see on the left originates. And by putting the umbrella device there, we take the umbrella device through a percutaneous approach. We go up through the vein, through the venous side, go across the intraatrial septum, the umbrella then is deployed at the mouth of the uh, left atrial appendage. And with time, it seals up. And once it fully seals up, the left atrial appendage is fully sealed and there's really no way for systemic embolism to occur from there um, and can reduce the risk of stroke. So the PROTECT AF study looked at left atrial appendage closure devices and randomized it against warfarin and showed that left atrial appendage device closures reduced the risk of stroke even better than warfarin did, about a, a 25 to 30% greater stroke risk reduction. So certainly it gives us an option in those where systemic anticoagulation is not an option to think about another strategy for stroke risk reduction. Another question that often comes up is, well, what if we just try to maintain sinus rhythm with antiarrhythmics or ablation? Can we avoid anticoagulation altogether? Um, there's been no true study that asked, looked at that question alone, but at least initial studies through the 80s and 90s and early 2000s suggested that maintaining sinus rhythm 
with antiarrhythmics did not reduce the risk of stroke or mortality. One of the large trials from the late 90s, early 2000s called AFFIRM, uh, which was a Canadian-led trial, showed no improvement in all-cause mortality or stroke by maintaining sinus rhythm. But one thing to notice that in that trial, anticoagulation was often stopped after sinus rhythm was restored. Um, and we know that restoring sinus rhythm does not necessarily prevent left atrial appendage thrombus. This is a photomicrograph from Manning from New England Journal of Medicine showing that someone on the left who is in atrial fibrillation had no left atrial appendage thrombus. They then cardioverted the patient back to sinus rhythm, brought them back for another TEE and showed even though they were in sinus rhythm, they did develop thrombus and left atrial appendage. And that's felt in, at least in part due to the fact that restoring sinus rhythm, sometimes you can still have electrical mechanical dissociation, meaning you see a nice P wave on the ECG, but the left atrium is stunned, is actually not contracting and thrombus can still form within the left atrial appendage. And we also know that obviously patients can have paroxysmal atrial fibrillation after cardioversion, go in and out of atrial fib and still form thrombus. So certainly restoring sinus rhythm does not negate the need for anticoagulation. So then the question came up, well, what if we maintain anticoagulation and then try to restore sinus rhythm? Does that improve cardiovascular outcomes? So that was looked at in two large trials, the East AF Net trial, which has gotten a lot of publicity. It came out recently and showed significant benefits, which I'll outline below. In a slightly older trial called Athena, in that trial, in both trials, we maintained sinus anticoagulation after, even after we tried to get them back into sinus rhythm. So the East AF Net trial came out just recently, looked at those with new onset or relatively new onset atrial fibrillation within the first year maintained them on anticoagulation and then looked at a strategy of either randomizing them to early rhythm control with antiarrhythmics. The primary antiarrhythmic use was flecainide with a smaller use of amiodarone and a small degree of ablation in between 8 to 10 percent versus usual care of rate control and anticoagulation. So about just over 27, uh, 2,700 patients randomized. And what we showed in that trial was that major adverse cardiovascular events were significantly lower in those that had an early rhythm control strategy versus usual care. And we, when we break up the individual components of the MACE endpoints, the major adverse events, cardiovascular death was significantly lower in those that had an early rhythm control strategy. Stroke was lower in those that we maintained sinus rhythm or attempted to maintain sinus rhythm. And there was a strong trend to reduced hospitalizations for worsening heart failure or acute coronary syndrome. So as a result, uh, many of us have adopted the strategy of if the atrial fibrillation is relatively new onset within the first year, that we should try to get them back into sinus rhythm as possible and try to maintain sinus rhythm. When we looked at the subgroups, all subgroups appeared to benefit by an attempt at sinus rhythm restoration, but particularly those with LV impairment or congestive heart failure had even greater benefits than those with you know, preserved LV function. So certainly in those with CHF and atrial fib, there may be significant benefits from attempts at restoring sinus rhythm. It was a very safe strategy with significant reductions in stroke and cardiovascular death. The main complication that was seen with restoration of sinus rhythm was drug-induced bradycardia. When we cardiovert them out, sometimes they develop bradycardia, sinus bradycardia, and uh, we can you know, need to bring up their rate sometimes with atropine. I've never needed to actually pace someone afterwards. That's certainly possible. Those that undergo ablation, obviously there's risks associated with any invasive procedure, but generally very effective and safe strategy that should be deployed uh, in patients that have potentially new onset atrial fibrillation. As I said, particularly those that have congestive heart failure and impaired LV function, there may be benefits at restoring sinus rhythm. The Castle AF study showed that perhaps restoring sinus rhythm, in this case with ablation, uh, improved ejection fraction significantly this continued yeah. pharmacological therapy. Similarly, meta-analysis of uh, restoring sinus rhythm suggested either ablation or cardioversion, getting them back into sinus rhythm may reduce the long-term risk of stroke as long as anticoagulation is still maintained. Restoring sinus rhythm does not negate the need for long-term anticoagulation. There's also observational data that suggests that maintaining sinus rhythm may reduce dementia. And there's a lot of work going into looking at the, the 
confluence of atrial fibrillation and cognitive impairment and dementia. We're involved in a very large trial from the Montreal Heart Institute called Brain AF, which is looking at the dementia and memory loss in those that have a low CHAD score that do not require anticoagulation, but still may have increased risk for memory loss and cognitive impairment and dementia. And one of the thoughts is that that the pulsatile wave uh, that, that atrial fibrillation creates when there is an irregular pulse, sometimes the RR interval is shorter, there's less cardiac output because of reduced uh, LV filling, then the, the you know, RR interval might be longer due to the irregularity of the pulse and there's greater cardiac output due to greater LV filling. That pulsatile nature uh, of cardiac output may result in impaired cerebral perfusion due to autoregulation in the brain, and that impaired cerebral perfusion perhaps could be a trigger to the development of a memory impairment, dementia, and cognitive impairment with time. All putative, a lot of research going into see uh, ways to reduce dementia risk. So when we think about certainly the question of rhythm versus rate control, historically our focus was on maintaining rate control, getting their heart rates below 100, and then maintaining anticoagulation. Now with the newer data coming through that perhaps rhythm control may provide greater efficacy, there is a greater emphasis, particularly in those with new onset atrial fibrillation, to try to maintain sinus rhythm as, as possible. And I'm going to conclude by talking about the role of lifestyle optimization. Uh, Jenny kindly introduced me as saying I'm a firm believer in, in, in cardiac rehab and I firmly believe lifestyle optimization is a key component to all cardiovascular disease management. We now have very compelling data uh, in atrial fibrillation as well. We were fortunate to participate in the active AF trial, which randomized patients to exercise rehab uh, versus usual care in those that have atrial fibrillation and looked at both the recurrence rate for atrial fibrillation as well as the uh, symptom burden. Uh, patients were randomized to on-site cardiac rehab um, for up to three to six months and uh, versus usual care. And what we showed is that those that went through an exercise rehab program had a significantly reduced atrial fibrillation burden. The recurrence of atrial fibrillation was significantly lower in those that effectively implemented an exercise rehab program. But similarly, uh, symptom burden was significantly lower. Patients just felt a lot better when they went through a rehab program, which is generally the case uh, to begin with, with uh, rehab program. So certainly uh, good data now that uh, lifestyle optimization can have important impacts uh, on atrial fibrillation patients. The 2020 AF guidelines from the Canadian Cardiovascular Society emphasize the central role of lifestyle optimization. Beyond exercise rehab, we know that we really need to counsel these patients on reduction of alcohol. You know, the new Canadian alcohol guidelines would suggest that we should be reducing alcohol to less than one to two drinks in a week. Uh, the reduction of tobacco and abstinence if possible. Sleep apnea, which I'll talk about in a minute, uh, is very common in atrial fibrillation patients and needs to be assessed and optimized and they should really be on CPAP therapy. It is very difficult to control atrial fibrillation and untreated sleep apnea. It, it leads to very high adrenergic drive, which can make uh, atrial fib rates very difficult to control and can be a trigger to atrial fib. Weight loss, a 10% weight loss does reduce the burden of atrial fibrillation, good diabetes and blood pressure control. And as we've talked about, exercise rehab can have significant impacts on cardiovascular outcomes in patients with atrial fibrillation. So sleep apnea, just spending a few minutes on that, is very common in patients with atrial fibrillation and is grossly underdiagnosed. It's felt that between one, you know, as much as one in 10 patients um, with uh, obstructive uh, sleep apnea have uh, underlying atrial fibrillation and often will get referrals from our sleep lab at CMH where they detect atrial fib during their monitoring. But equally as much as 50% of patients with atrial fib have a comorbid sleep apnea. And if atrial fib patients have sleep apnea, unless we adequately control sleep apnea, it's very, very difficult to actually control their atrial fib rate. So certainly in a significant number of patients with atrial fib, if they have the body habitus and the symptoms to suggest possible sleep apnea, we should be looking for that and encouraging adherence to appropriate therapies where required. So all of this really led the Canadian Cardiovascular Society to emphasize the need for an integrated approach to atrial fibrillation management and suggested that a multidisciplinary team approach should be given to the management of atrial fibrillation patients so that they can have access to both pharmacological therapy for rate control, appropriate anticoagulation, 
rhythm control with either antiarrhythmics or ablation and appropriate lifestyle optimization. And based on those recommendations from the Canadian Cardiovascular Society, the Cambridge Cardiac Care Center developed a dedicated multidisciplinary rapid access atrial fibrillation clinic now a number of years ago to try to meet some of those goals that the CCS had recommended. You know, prior to us starting this up, the data, actually this is the most recent data from ISIS from 2021, suggesting that there is still significant delays across Ontario and appropriate atrial fibrillation management from ER as much as 14 weeks from, on, from diagnosis of atrial fib to the time that they are started on anticoagulation. Urgent care centers even worse at 18 weeks, even family practice as much as a one and a half month delay in appropriate anticoagulation. Is there a risk from delaying anticoagulation? This was a, a question that was looked at in an American study of over 26,000 patients. And what they showed in that study is that waiting as little as 30 days to initiate anticoagulation in those at risk can significantly increase, again, the risk of developing dementia by as much as 30%. So if they have a CHAD score that warrants anticoagulation and they're at risk for embolic events, anticoagulation should be initiated as early as possible by the first uh, healthcare provider that diagnoses atrial fib, assuming it's safe to do so. So there's really no role for delaying anticoagulation if it can be initiated safely. So our rapid access atrial fib clinic, I'll just complete by just describing it for you. It is a nurse led clinic, physician supervised. The goal is for first contact with the patient within 48 to 72 hours to reduce the delays that can increase their risk for complications. It is agnostic to the long-term follow-up uh, by the MRP. It can be followed by any uh, specialist, cardiologist, internist, or by primary care. And the goal of the, the clinic is not for a workup or uh, cardiac investigations, but to ensure that patients are getting appropriate rate control to prevent tachycardia-mediated cardiomyopathy, to ensure that they receive appropriate anticoagulation based on their CHADS VAS score, and to offer appropriate lifestyle optimizations through diet, exercise, smoking cessation through the cardiac rehab program that's run there. To date, we've seen uh, over 1,300 patients through the rapid access AFib clinic. It typically takes the clinic about three and a half uh, visits uh, to get the patient optimized so that their care can be returned back to their, their specialist of record or primary care as, as appropriate. So I'm going to complete the, the, the presentation by just giving you the, my top uh, seven takeaway messages for atrial fibrillation on the current uh, stage and current dates. So atrial fibrillation, uh, to conclude, is a very common and increasing cardiac condition. As our population ages, the burden for atrial fib will continue to increase, and we certainly need to try to make early diagnosis and consider anticoagulation to both reduce the risk for stroke and systemic embolism and also potentially to reduce the risk of cognitive decline and dementia in these patients. NOACs are preferred agents uh, for atrial fibrillation, stroke, and systemic embolism reduction, except those with mechanical heart valves or rheumatic mitral stenosis associated atrial fibrillation. So when we say you know, valvular AFib, we are referring specifically only to mechanical heart valve AFib or mitral stenosis AFib. Other valvular conditions like aortic stenosis, aortic insufficiency, or mitral regurgitation, NOACs can still be used very effectively, but specifically in mechanical heart valves or mitral stenosis patients, warfarin is still the preferred drug of choice. There is clinical equipoise right now on how to anticoagulate patients with end-stage renal disease or dialysis patients who develop atrial fibrillation. In the U.S., apixaban is being used commonly. In Canada, uh, Thrombosis Canada has still recommended warfarin um, over, over NOACs, although a significant number of, of nephrologists have turned to using uh, apixaban specifically in that population, even in Canada. In those who truly cannot be anticoagulated, either because they've had a prior intracranial hemorrhage or have active bleeding, left atrial appendage closure devices, and the device that's commonly available in Canada is called a Watchman device, can provide effective stroke risk reduction, um, but obviously carries a risk of a uh, cardiac procedure. It is done percutaneously, and the main complication is local vascular complications from access. Recent studies have suggested that in new onset atrial fibrillation within the first year, an attempt should be made to try to restore sinus rhythm to reduce both the risk for strokes, heart failure, and potentially a cardiovascular mortality reduction as per the East AFNET study.
And finally, lifestyle optimization and cardiac rehabilitation can provide significant benefits and should be offered to atrial fibrillation patients where appropriate. So at that point, I will uh, stop talking and open it up to any questions uh, that people may have. Thank you very much for that talk. I think that was uh, able to target most of our patients that we would see. Um, I do have one question to kick it off. I see a couple of couple of questions in the chat, and I will get to those. Um, but I guess one of the populations that I don't think I heard much about was that patient who is identified to be an AFib intraoperatively, no history of AFib pre-op, at least what we've been able to acknowledge. Uh, they came in for an elective procedure. They're now in an AFib in the OR or in the recovery room. What is the, what is the sort of urgency to start anticoagulation in this post-op, often a joint patient, um, for whom we're still going to do a bit of workup to see the frequency of the AFib? And many of these patients don't actually show us AFib on their halter in the next month or six weeks. Uh, so what are the what are the general recommendations then? Yeah, excellent question, Jenny. And so that is actually a, a question that's being actively investigated right now. What to do with patients that have transient atrial fibrillation, either detected at the at the time of uh, an operative procedure, or perhaps you know another question that comes up is devices. So if they have a pacemaker in place and they have transient AFib that's detected on a pacemaker defibrillator, what do we do with those? really not clear what the answer is. Uh, there are two large trials that are ongoing right now uh, that are randomizing a brief uh, paroxysmal atrial fibrillation to anticoagulation versus control uh, versus not. Those should be reporting in the next two years and we will have you know randomized trail data in that population. Right now, you know, my personal strategy is that if their CHAD score really puts them at a systemic embolism risk, I will go ahead and anticoagulate them. And, you know, assuming it's safe to do so post-op once the hemostasis is obtained. And then subsequently, you know, work them up, see what is the burden. And if they really do not have any recurrence of AFib with prolonged monitoring, then take them off. Um, again, driven by the fact that early anticoagulation can have both systemic embolism reduction, but also cognitive protection. Um, but you know, I don't think there's a right answer yet. We don't have any trial data yet to, to answer that, but we will in the next couple of years. That's great, thank you. Um, in the chat, I see Dr. Kavanaugh, you, your hand went up first. Yeah, it was a similar question and it's about the intermittent atrial fibrillation brief bouts that we see particularly now that people have their watches reporting these things. How, when do we go from intermittent being equivalent to continuous? That's the tough question. It is a very tough question. And the answer is similar to what I just said, Jim. Good to see you today. Um, so, you know, the, there's actually a trial that St. Mike's in Toronto is running uh, looking at Apple watches for detection of atrial fibrillation and uh, determining what, what we should be doing with that. Um, it, it was some, surprisingly, some of these watches actually have a pretty good uh, accuracy, which I've been shocked by, by some of the data that's come out with, particularly the Apple Watch. The question really comes down to, you know, what do we do with that result, in particular if it's very brief? And there is no answer yet, Jim. There, there are trials that are looking at that and we will have answers. I think most of us approach it as to until the trial data comes out as to, you know, the duration. Um, and, you know, on a whole tour, you know, different people have different cut points, but, you know, at least over 30 seconds to a minute of atrial fib is the minimum that people would consider, uh, you know, enough. Some people say that it should be much longer than that. And some people actually say you need to have as much as, you know, on a device, as much as 24 hours of atrial fib before they would consider it. Um, you know, the my approach to this comes down to again until the trial comes out with very safe and you know low bleed risk with the, the NOACs that are available to us assuming that their bleed risk is low and uh, their stroke risk is high enough using the CHADS calculator then I still you know even with briefer up so it's not not less than 30 seconds but you know if they have a minute or two of atrial fib i'll have that discussion with that patient saying you know we don't have the data yet uh, to say you know what the right answer is but my personal preference is to think about anticoagulation in that setting um, uh, because the bleeding risk is so low and i didn't bring up there was a trial called Averos that actually randomized uh, patients that uh, 
or had a higher uh, bleed risk to just aspirin uh, versus apixaban and uh, showed that apixaban had similar bleeding risk to just aspirin alone and had obviously much better stroke risk reduction. And so, you know, if someone is safe enough to be on a baby aspirin, if they have AF, then likely, you know, a uh, safe agent like apixaban or doxban, you know, might provide uh, better stroke risk reduction um, with relatively low bleeding rate. There's actually a trial that's just started from Harvard that's looking at uh, a subcutaneous uh, uh, factor 10A with a very long acting uh, that's given once a month. Uh, and they're looking at a longer formulation of once a year. Uh, there may be other options that are around the corner um, that give us you know, e e greater uh, options. But certainly right now, there's no right answer yet, Jim. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Schaefer. Hi, thanks, Jenny, and especially thanks, Shaker. That was really a, a wonderful presentation. What you think is a small topic, but it's really very complicated, and you presented it in a very clear uh, and informative way. So thank you very much. Um, <laughs> one of the things that shocks me about AFib, uh, you know, is that we have these CHAD scores in CHADS2 and CHADS VASC. Uh, for, pa for patients under 65 with the zero CHADS, you know, we, we then look at the atherosclerosis burden. Uh, yet, on the other side of it, we have just the, well, if they hit 65 with lone AFib, just put them on a DOAC. Um, is that good evidence or a lack of evidence that sort of subdivides those patients older than 65? Uh, and is there are there any studies being done on that? Yeah, excellent question, Mark. So it is partly a lack of evidence, um, but we all, we know that age is a very strong determinant, both for the incidence of atrial fib, but also stroke risk. And, you know, it's, it's obviously arbitrary to say 65, why not 64, why not 66? You know, it's just a number. But, you know, we know that age is is a predictor for systemic embolism, and yeah, it's part of the, the CHAD score itself, right? So Historically, the, the, the older CHADs used 75 as the, the age cutoff. You know, the newer CHAD score, CHADs 2, will get started at 65. And it really came down to the, the discussions at the Canadian Cardiovascular Society that the NOACs are just so safe with such low bleeding risk that the risk benefit analysis that was done showed that, you know, if you have no other risk factors but age alone, there is still uh, significant enough stroke risk reduction uh, with uh, the NOAC. So certainly in someone who has a CHADS, uh, mm -hmm. you know, as CHAD 65 and their only criteria is age, you know, if you're going to anticoagulate them, they really should be on a NOAC in that setting because of their preferable bleeding profile. But there's no trial mark that, that I'm aware of that specifically asks that question. If your only risk factor is an age above 65, um, randomizing them to anticoagulation versus versus not. Um, so it is, you know, sort of a consensus opinion from uh, the, the Canadian Cardiac Society. Uh, thanks, Shaker. So there's a question in the chat, um, and I've sort of been waiting for this question because um, I'm asked it a lot, actually. Uh, wondering if you have any idea or are aware if whether or not the ODB formulary will change. Uh, the wording mm -hmm. for most of the DOACs is that the patient, it sort of implies that the patient should try warfarin first. Uh, I know many of us have interpreted this in various different ways. So I think from primary care perspective, uh, I do know many of us are sending patients home from hospital on DOAX, and some of the primary care folks may be interpreting things differently and feeling that the patient should be on warfarin based on the ODB criteria. I'm wondering if you could speak to that. Yeah, excellent question, Jenny. So, um, you know, I do sit on the uh, ODB uh, committee for cardiovascular drugs, and I wasn't on the specific committee, the subcommittee that looked at that NOACs, but you know, it's it's a very cumbersome system at uh, at ODB and very slow to move. Um, you know, the NOACs are all, uh, you know, three of them have are, are generic, will be generic very soon. Uh, the fourth is still uh, patent protected for a little bit of time, but certainly, you know, the costs have gone down for some of the NOACs, and and the biggest determinant for ODB is often that cost benefit uh, that drives it. So far, there has not yet been another committee call to relook at the the uh, the ODB criteria, 
um, but presumably there will be. They have done that historically as drugs come off patent and cost goes down. So that that, that criteria may change with time. Now, in terms of how to interpret it, you know, um, as you said, different people interpret it differently. Um, certainly, you know, a, a number of us interpret it to say when you actually read it, it says, you know, if uh, either they failed you know, warfarin, which would mean that you're waiting for someone to have a stroke on warfarin or a serious bleed, um, which you know, hopefully none of us are waiting for, um, or that it's a difficulty in you know, appropriate monitoring. And so certainly somebody you know, who's in eMERGE or has been in hospital and you're not sure about you know, how that INR monitoring is going to happen, you know, often in that setting, it's much safer for them to be on NOACs. Um, and you know, for me, when I'm speaking to the patient, often you know, the elderly, they really struggle. At the, at the beginning, you know, warfarin requires very close monitoring. You know, they're going for blood work once or twice a week uh, until the INR level stabilize. And in uh, you know, a large trial uh, from, uh, from uh, Hamilton called ACTIVE, uh, you know, they randomized to warfarin versus antiplatelets. And even though warfarin was superior than aspirin alone, it was not superior in the first year. Uh, there were much greater bleeding rates and complications in uh, in the, uh, the the warfarin arm because it took so long to stabilize warfarin, and so that's one of the questions I always have for my patients with when I'm thinking about it when I'm talking to them and saying you know can you get to the the lab frequent enough and particularly you know when the pandemic was really at its peak we just couldn't get any of these people to the labs and get INR monitoring effectively, but even now we struggle with the elderly population making sure that they are getting to labs properly, and I interpret the guidelines to say if you can not safely you know, monitor their INR because the patient can't get to labs appropriately or they have transportation issues or shut-ins and things like that, then it's not safe for them to be on warfarin. And there, you know, a, a NOAC uh, could be uh, considered. And, the, you know, it just, it's nuancing the guidelines. Um, and, you know, and, you know, I just also go step back to say, you know, the Canadian Cardiovascular Society is very categorical. Since 2012, the preferred drugs for stroke risk reduction in atrial fibrillation is a NOAC, um, assuming that the renal function and things tolerates it properly. So, you know, I think we've got, you know, guideline committees and consensus statements and the Canadian Cardiovascular Society, you know, supporting our choices. And, you know, if someone, you know, is not, can't be safely monitored, then I think NOAC should be used. And that's how I look at it. But the, the guideline committee to relook at it has not been recommissioned yet. Thank you. Um, and I think one more question, uh, Dr. Nguyen. Uh, I heard uh, the talk. Um, I think that the um, the data on, on the outcomes uh, from cardiovascular uh, standpoint is, is clear. I guess that the question I have from um, what we see is, is there any long term or at least uh, um, uh, uh, the uh, outcome or, or at least follow up of these patients from a, uh, anemia standpoint? Since, since th this has been more uh, standard to practice, um, uh, we've seen sort of really a real rise in referrals for looking at uh, anemia. And some of them are quite profound. Uh, yeah deficiency anemia that we really can't find the source of um and may, anecdotally i see it i'm just not sure if there's a long-term uh, follow-up of these patients what the rate of these things are and and what the recommendations in some of these patients where uh we do uh, essentially uh, investigation an entire gi tract and find no obvious uh, source of, of, of blood loss yeah, excellent question. So in terms of the actual randomized trials, they clearly were not long enough to answer that question. Once the, the curve separated, it wasn't ethical to continue those trials and the trials stopped. Um, they did, a couple of them did do extension uh, monitoring of patients that, that were on the NOACs to see what was the leading complication rates and still at least out to five to seven years of follow-up, um, you know, the, there was not a, an increase. So what they showed in the trials was that the bleeding complications were usually up front uh, within the first few months of initiation of the anticoagulation. And those that did not have bleeding complications within the first few months of initiation, you know, longer term, at least out to five to seven years, um, didn't have a, a, a late increase. Um, 
in terms of populational data, uh, there are populational surveys, um, you know, that are registries that have monitored these patients out for, you know, a decade or so. And you're, you're exactly right. There's definitely an increase in anemia rates, um, and you know, the source is often unclear where uh, where that anemia is coming from. Is it GI? You know, I guess there's a very small chance that it could be retroperitoneal or some other place. Um, but uh, that's definitely something that you know. When we talk about monitoring patients on NOAX for their renal function, uh, you know, at least yearly, um, you know, they should also be monitored for the potential development of anemia. Uh, and certainly we know that as renal function declines, uh, you know, the risk for, for bleeding may start to increase. And, and that's really one of the key reasons to monitor them is do you need to dose reduce if their EGFR starts to fall? Because if their EGFR significantly falls, you know, the risk for, for GI bleeding will go up significantly on the full dose. So. Um, no easy, you know, uh, randomized data on that, but uh, some data suggesting that there's not necessarily a late uh, you know, rise, but a, likely a slow constant risk for, for uh, bleeding. Thank you very much.